What is it that drives humanity? I asked a friend if I could interview him and get his perspective on what makes us chase our dreams. I first met James Blackburn when we were both extras on the movie Beer Fest in 2006. Okay, so we are rolling. Uh, I'm here with James Blackburn, the subject of my documentary biography. James, tell me what it is you love about filmmaking. I think, I, I, it's similar to music to me, how you can construct something from pieces that you gather, and, and, and when you put it all together, it's like, you know, like almost making a, a pie or a cake. If, with all those ingredients together, you come up with some sort of magical thing at the end. I wanted to get a little bit of a background of his life to see how filmmaking had entrenched itself so firmly in his psyche. I was born in Bedford, Indiana. I moved to the Chicago area, then I moved to Tampa, Florida, and then we moved back to the Chicago area, and then back to Indiana, and then we moved back to Chicago area again. <laughs> you moved around a lot. It must have been kind of hard to, to maintain a steady group of friends. It was, it was like every school year I would be in a different school and I'd have a, a, a new set of brand new friends and I'd be like, you're my best friend in the world. And then we'd move and I'd never see him again. My mom was a single mom most of the time with three young boys and we struggled. We were a welfare family. What did movies mean to you growing up? For me, movies and television, they both meant the same thing. I learned a lot of valuable lessons growing up watching shows like The Brady Bunch even though it was just a sitcom and it was a comedy, there were still lessons, life lessons in there about teaching you to be a better person, not to smoke, things like that. So I consider movies uh, a babysitter in some ways when I was a kid, but they were also an, an escape. Movies and television were 90 minutes. You could watch a movie and not be in your own life for a little bit. While living in Chicago, James got his first taste of Hollywood when he was cast as an extra in The Negotiator with Samuel L. Jackson and Kevin Spacey in 1998. Not long after, he moved to New Mexico where he joined a troop of gunfight reenactors. Sheriff! Sheriff! They're robbing my bank! So? So? So do something! Oops. It was his experience with the New Mexico gunfighters which landed him several featured roles in western-themed productions in and around New Mexico. He played mountain men, explorers, and soldiers. He was even allowed to shoot at Russell Crowe and Christian Bale for the final shootout in James Mangold's remake of 310 to Yuma. What is the one thing that you're the most proud of? I'd say the Lone Ranger comes to mind. Almost everything that, that Army did in the movie, I did it first. Uh, it's an accomplishment because it was hard. It was a hard job. As much as, re as rewarding as it was, you know, there was a lot of long days and a lot of intense weather on that one. Uh, but yeah, Lone Ranger. That's my quick answer. Lone Ranger. Uh, a lot of you may recognize him as Mr. Army Hammer. And uh, he is the Lone Ranger. No, no, no. James is the Lone Ranger. James wrote, directed, produced, and starred in a feature-length stoner comedy called The 420 Movie. It has seen limited success, but was obviously a labor of love, taking over a year to make. I asked him why, despite this accomplishment, he lists his stand-in work on The Lone Ranger as his proudest moment. That's a good question because, to be honest with you, I spent about as much time on the 420 movie as I did on the Lone Ranger. Well, to be honest with you, the 420 movie, uh, the exhaustion level wasn't quite the level it was on Lone Ranger, where I was there five to six days a week for seven months in a row. And it was a movie that, you know, I made uh, for fun. The re you know, the reason why I got in the movie business was I hope to achieve immortality in a way. We're only on this planet for a very short amount of time, and if I'm in movies, 
a hundred years from now, if the planet's still here and the humans are still functioning, those movies will still be watched. And people will see me standing next to Peter Fonda and Marissa Torme and Steve Zahn and they'll say, I wonder who that guy was. And maybe they won't know my name, but I'm preserved permanently on film now. And then I also got to be one of Marissa Torme's uh, men. Uh, she had four guys. The, the name is Tome. You, you mean Marissa Tome, right? Uh, what did I say? You said Torme. No, I didn't. You said Torme. This interview's over. I didn't say that. <laughs>